today we'll be speaking with Rupert about his book, Why Climate Breakdown Matters. Um, he is a professor. Oh, there you go. A little little show for you on the Zoom. Such a beautiful Zoom book, camp. isn't it? The whales. <laughs> Um, so um, in the summer, we did a joint project through the UKSSN reviewing this book. There was, I think, six of us um, that did it all together. We all kind of had a chapter each in which we reviewed. And then I know many of us went on to read the whole book. Um, it was sort of published on the 11th of August. So it was it was kind of a through the summer project. It was staff and students that did this. Um, and I think there was quite a few as a lot of feedback given I mean I know I personally found it pretty challenging it certainly put a slight downer on my summer but it was a it was a really really brilliant read um so Rupert would you like to sort of introduce what your book is about for people that haven't read it yet yeah so the book is really my uh, magnum opus on climate what does magnum opus mean it means literally basically something like big book or collection of my thoughts or something like that. Uh, so I've written a, a quite a number of books um, across the years and, and and several books sort of around the climate and nature in recent years. But this one sort of really tries to kind of put all my thoughts together in one place. So, so if you want to read something by me, you can just read that book and you've sort of got the whole lot. Uh, and well, Ashley mentioned that it isn't always the cheeriest of reads. I mean, basically, a, a simple way to sum it up is to say that in the book, I start out by setting out how bad the situation is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the climate and uh, our ecosystems and how it's worse than most people uh, are willing to admit. And, I, and then about halfway through the book, I ask the question, OK, so what are we going to do about this? But rather than just doing the usual thing, which is people say, oh, well, there's lots of reasons for it to be optimistic or saying, well, here's a list of all the things we should do or something like that. I make a very different suggestion. I suggest that actually the way to handle this difficult situation is to go deeper into it. And I suggest that if we're going to come through this crisis, and I still believe it's possible to come through it and transform and end up on balance stronger, then the way to do that is by means of facing unflinchingly the bad, not by trying to turn away and think, oh, but here's some other things which make me feel better or, oh, here's some things we can do and maybe that will be enough, because they won't. The, the list of things to do are never, are never uh, real, if you know what I mean. They never actually add up to being enough. I suggest that what we need to do is we need to face unflinchingly the difficulty of the situation. And I suggest that if we do, then there are various things which can start to come good out of the bad. I suggest that this vast cloud really does have a potential silver lining. Uh, so to give a few um, examples of that, I point out that there are going to be more and more climate disasters for a long time to come. And you might think, well, that's really terrible. And of course, it is really terrible. But I point out that those climate disasters could have a silver lining because they bring people together. Disasters bring people together. I mean, the classic example, which everyone in Britain is aware of, is the Blitz in the Second World War. That uh, in the Second World, early in the Second World War, Britain was uh, subject to a terrible campaign of bombing from Germany. And for a long time, people really didn't know what was going to happen, whether we were going to get through it or not at all. Um, and you might think, how awful? And of course, it was awful. But it was also great. Um, people found the Blitz spirit in the Blitz, right? The famous Blitz spirit. The Blitz spirit is the spirit of sort of indomitability. It's the spirit of people coming together. It's the spirit of building community. And that's a really important theme that uh, so much of the, of the tough stuff that we're facing can build community. It can make us stronger uh, together uh, in response to it. And actually, if you talk to a lot of people who survived the Second World War, as most people, of course, did, um, uh, talking to my grandparents, for example, I remember um, them telling me about how, and sometimes people are even a bit sheepish about this, about how it was actually a great time to be alive, about how people felt a great sense of meaning in their lives, about how the bombing, etc., brought people together, as I just said, about how um, people were growing food in their gardens, growing food all over the place to try to, try to stop Hitler from starving uh, them out, all this kind of stuff. And there's loads more I could tell you, and there's loads more in the book. 
So that's kind of one big set of examples of how the bad stuff that we're going to be going through has this good side, has the, there's, a, there's an upside to the down. Um, and another big example is I have a chapter on difficult emotions, climate anxiety, eco anxiety, climate grief, etc. You know, I'm sure that a lot of you are feeling some of that. And in a way, what I'm trying to do in my book is give permission for that. So you don't have to deny it. You don't have to suppress it. It's rational. It's healthy. It can actually lead us in the right direction. These emotions are there for a reason. They make sense. It makes sense to experience grief in relation to what's happening to the natural world. It makes sense to experience some anxiety in relation to the climate situation. It's good. It's rational. Everyone's doing it. People just aren't talking about it that much. But people are starting to talk about it more. And the way I try to talk about it in the book is I try to suggest again, this seemingly bad thing, these difficult emotions can actually be good because it's a way of recognizing what's happening to the world. And it's a portal to doing something about it. If you're anxious or grief stricken or angry, you're much more likely to do something than if you just kind of ah, blah, it doesn't really bother me that much. So part of what we saw with the school climate strikes and other stuff in the last few years is people who were, including, of course, young people who were anxious and angry and so forth, finding a route from that into doing something about it. So this is really the fundamental argument of the book, that climate breakdown seems to be something which is just bad. But I suggest that the way we get through it is by seeing the good side of the bad. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the reviewers who reviewed it. Uh, it was the first review of the book because I think a lot of you really saw that. Uh, and um, that was that was gratifying and, and, and great. Is that enough, Ashley? Is that the kind of thing you were hoping that for? Was, yeah, <laughs> that was absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, I know you were talking about the eco-anxiety one and that was the chapter I reviewed. The, right. Um, why climate shit my climate grief may yet be the making of us that was, that's right that was that was the chapter I got and I think um throughout the UK and we have had quite a few conversations about that and that has been something that has been a very sort of very real feeling and emotion yeah. for a lot of the students and teachers that sort of yeah. are part of this network so we have had um conversations with sort of like psychologists and stuff like that about that because it is you are right it is beginning to be spoken about way more than I mean it probably wasn't even a term used 10 years ago no absolutely um, yeah um so and I've just got a few questions so and um as I was yeah so I just finished year 12 and I reviewed this book and I found it like really di a difficult difficult read um yeah. so I was wondering sort of like what audience were you at trying to sort of appeal to who was the who was the book meant for well um yeah <laughs> It's almost a cop out, but I would say the book's meant for anyone who's just about ready for it. Um, I don't expect everyone to be ready for it, um, but I do think there's a growing audience for this kind of thing. And it's interested young people, it's teachers, it's fellow academics, you know, philosophers and other academics will, I hope, be interested in this book. Well, I know some of them are. Um, it's uh, activists or people who might be thinking about being activists it could be almost anybody really it's anybody who wants to know what's really going on wants to understand why it matters wants to is willing to get to the point of starting to really confront it and who is interested in not just spectating or speculating but in potentially doing something about it so you know the book as uh, as some of you will be aware ends with some recommendations. They're not these kind of pat recommendations like, you know, change your, your light bulbs or something. They're much sort of bigger recommendations in terms of trying to follow through on the on the sort of upside of down stuff and trying to trying to start to take seriously the opportunities that are offered us by climate disasters or by these difficult emotions or by waking up to the way we've been treating non-human animals uh, and really building something that rises to the occasion from out of it um yeah that was um I think the recommendations at the back were it was yeah I think a lot of us especially quite like to the greenwashing that goes on and stuff like that is one of those things changing light bulbs doesn't do too much and um, but yes and I've just got another um another question would be um like you know we, we were the first people to review it you said and yeah that was a really really 
great experience for us all. What sort of other feedback, either academically or just from general readers, have you had from the book? Well, you know, it's been very positive so far. Um, I've had a few reviews now and also one or two um, speeches made about the book and talks. Uh, people, quite diverse people, are are interested. You know, I think that I think the timing is right in the sense that we're at a time now where people are waking up to how serious the situation is, are increasingly determined to do something about it. This is what I call the uh, arising of a, a new moderate flank in climate action, that there are people all over the place in the academic world, teachers, lawyers, people who are just trying to do something in their local community, maybe grow some food together, stuff like that. There's all sorts of people who want to know what's really going on and want to know what to do about it in a way that wasn't the case five years ago. So I've, I, I've been very gratified by the feedback so far. I'm hoping there's going to be a lot more. Uh, and yeah, I feel like the the time is sort of ripe, uh, that, um, that people are re ready now to hear this fairly uncompromising, challenging, message and to and to start to sort of go on a journey with it and through it and see what uh, what emerges the other side lovely thank you i'm gonna hand over to mary to ask a few more questions now hello hi rupert i'm feeling a little bit starstruck i have to be sad um oh. <laughs> so yeah I, I your book was amazing i'm i've been a passionate environmentalist as long as i can remember um, mm. I'm like 50 now so that's a fair time um, and it, it really felt like a summing up to me of, of yeah. the kind of pathway that I've been through, including the fact that I've come through in the last few years to like working with these youth just give me so much inspiration and so much mm. hope for the future mm. that's actually different. Yeah. Having spent my entire life kind of trying to push for that and feeling like I'm not getting anywhere. Suddenly it feels like we're pushing on an open door a little bit, um, which has been really great. So my question would be, I suppose you that the any advice on dealing with speaking to people about it. So many people I talk to about it. Yeah. Listen, they hear the message, they hear, yes, climate breakdown matters, and then they're always kind of glaze over and they mm -hmm. carry on talking to their mates about the football or the fact that they're going to Mallorca for the holiday or you know what what they're doing for Christmas. And it, it, it's like, what what how? I, I've never, I've spent my entire life not understanding why people don't hear what, <laughs> it's always been blindingly obvious to me. If we carry on down this path, things yeah. are going to go probably wrong. How, how can you not see that? And other people do see it and then, ah, uh, they choose to do something else instead. Have you got any advice on ways to Yeah, it? well, this is, a, this is a big question, right? This is a tough question. I, I do have some advice, but I don't have a silver bullet. Um, I think we're all kind of continuing to uh, to go on this journey of trying to discover what um, what moves people, what can affect people, etc. I would say that the word moves is a bit of a clue. I think that um, the emotional register is crucial. I think that one thing that's become very clear is that facts alone don't motivate. We need um, story and we need emotionality. We need emotional authenticity, which is something that I think we brought in Extinction Rebellion and certainly my young friend Greta brought and, and with her a lot of uh, uh, young people and, and school children and so forth. Um, and that comes back again to the so-called negative uh, emotions, uh, which by the way, um, uh, all come as I argue in the book uh, from, from love, from care, so there's a positive route to them all, yeah, um, that, uh, as Ashley knows very well, uh, I argue that the reason why we grieve is, is because we love, we're, we're uh, afraid for, uh, for those who we love, including ourselves and so forth. Um, so I think that um, you can't expect that just relating to people the facts is enough. You have to find emotional hooks or anchors. Um, and I take, I hope to have offered a number of them in the in the book. Obviously, the one that I start with, which is again very pertinent to where we are this evening, is children. Uh, and I think that, um, yeah, as I argue in chapter one of the book, that um, 
that what we are as human beings is beings who care about and raise the next generation uh, and the next generation are going to have it tough because of the decisions or lack of decisions of the the last uh, generation uh, and so if one's talking with uh, with parents and most people most adults are parents you know that's a way and it's a very challenging way in but it's a way and I think it's essential for us to uh, take because it's crucial for parents to understand that it's no longer possible for them to look after and protect and care for their children only in the ways that they used to. So in the old days, people would think something like, well, if I feed my children well and bring them up well and teach them decent manners and get them into a good school and so on and so forth, then they're going to have a decent chance in life. You still need to do all that, but there's something else as well, which is that, that we need together to try to create the conditions for our children and young people to have a, a decent future as opposed to a really worrying spiraling downwards kind of uh, future um, and that is something that is a responsibility which all parents and in fact all adults um, now share um, so I would say that's one of the ways in is by trying to get people to step up to their responsibility as parents. Now that is gonna unleash some very difficult and unpleasant emotions once again, um, guilt perhaps, fear certainly, um, but that is part of what has to happen. That is a route that we have to uh, go down. Um, the other kind of top tip I would share is um, the potential role of the, of the arts. Um, so I put in the chat my little um, uh, video, which some of you may have seen, Out of the Ashes, which uh, I think, you know, well, it's pretty hard hitting, like the like the book, maybe even more so. Um, and a number of people, it's been viewed about 300,000 times now across platforms. And a number of people have said to me that it kind of affected them uh, where just words alone had not uh, affected them. And that's just a microcosm, really. There are There's all sorts of good literature now. Uh, so-called cli-fi for example uh, about the uh, about the climate uh, crisis um, in terms of stuff that's accessible to children uh, I would mention um, uh, the carbon diaries um, by Sachi Lloyd uh, very good brace of novels um, I would mention um, uh, Ursula Le Guin's work some of which is incredibly uh, pertinent um, I would mention um, uh, for some of the, for some children here, I'm not sure who the youngest one is, but uh, Game of Thrones um, for those who, for whom it's age appropriate uh, is uh, an allegory about uh, about climate change and uh, what we do about it. That's what it is, um, and it's worth really thinking that through and following that through. And I think we need a lot more of this. I, I've, I've been arguing that we need a lot more um, art, media, and entertainment. Uh, Don't Look Up is another, of course, very massive recent example, uh, which really gets into this. And that can shift people potentially where other stuff doesn't. And I would say to uh, anyone, any young person on the call who's thinking about what to do with their life. I mean, if you're artistically talented or musically talented or whatever, um, then that's a really great thing to do. Try to actually create something which is really going to tell this story in a way that moves people. Yeah, that's brilliant. Interestingly, I, I did actually grow up reading Ursula Le Guin almost constantly. So ah, interesting yeah. mentioning that. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking wondered, about. Yeah. I have wondered how much that type of uh, reading kind of influenced me. Yeah. And also in, interesting that one of the very successful conversations I think I had in my entire time was with my brother when our children were very small about 20 years ago, saying eventually managed to convince him that this was a thing that would happen. It was just a matter of time scales. And yes. pointing out to him that if okay you don't care about the time scales now are you going to care about the time scales in 40 years time when you have grand grandchildren what about 60 years time when you have great grandchildren do you think you'll, you'll care any less and i saw his face kind of pale slightly and go oh well when his wife went you know she's right don't you yeah <laughs> yeah yeah really kind of well, that's it good so you 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 can do it you know yeah. how to do it yeah, yeah yeah no and i like the idea of the arts actually that's probably something i neglect because i'm a science teacher so it's often forgotten well science is um, super relevant too i guess the reason i emphasize the arts so much is a they're sometimes neglected in this context and b they have so much capacity to move you know sometimes people yes. think something like well this is about science it's about science well it's about science but it's also about the arts 
yeah, but I think in all my time of teaching the science of it, I very rarely had a, any true influence on children. So maybe that's partly why that mm. you need the arts. I loved your video. So I'll pass over to Ashley, see if Thank she you. has any more questions. Thank you. Yeah, and while we're just maybe waiting for some questions to come through to the chat, so yes, yeah, so like Jess put a message in just saying if anyone in the audience has got anything they would like to ask, I can put those questions to Rupert. My question is, is sort of what's next for you? Have you got any projects lined up, sort of anything in the works? That you'd like to share with us well i do i do funnily enough yeah so uh, i'm working on this thing uh, which uh, you'd be very welcome to check out called the the moderate flank that i mentioned before um that's the really the biggest thing i'm doing in terms of kind of writing type projects there's a number of things but the the one i'm most excited about which um a little bit of a departure from me but it takes off really from the stuff around grief and so on uh is i'm in the early stages of writing a book about eco spirituality so the idea there being basically um, what if for the kind of transformation we need, it's not enough to have a political transformation, an economic transformation. What if we need a sort of civilizational transformation, a spiritual transformation? What if it's really about, you know, how we relate to the earth and other beings in, in a level of that's that kind of fundamental? And well, that's what I think. And that's what I'm going to be exploring uh, in that book. Um, if that still seems a bit mysterious to you, I would mention the film Avatar, which, of course, the sequel is finally coming out later this month. And I'm going to be writing about that in The in the Guardian. I'll look out for that maybe in a few weeks time. Um, Avatar was and it's still the, the biggest blockbuster of, of all time, um, was a film centered around a sort of lived eco spirituality. And I think that's one of the reasons why it really made such an impact, because I think a lot of people sort of got that uh, aspect of it and then the other thing i'd like to mention that's coming up for me in terms of projects is i'm going to be doing more in terms of my own engagement with um the arts filmmaking the media etc so uh, i'm working um on trying to get some plays uh, about um the ecological and climate situation uh taken around the country plays that were inspired by my earlier book this civilization is finished um I'm working with um, someone at the BBC about trying to dramatise the concerns which I have, which are very real, around our food system, potential climate induced food crisis in the future. And finally, um, I'm working, this is, and this is possibly the most exciting of them all, I'm working with a scriptwriter on a project for a TV series, which would be about different possible climate futures. So roughly like what would the climate what would the future look like if the climate goes really downhill and what would it look like if we managed to get a grip on things in the next generation uh, and the idea in this series is to dramatize those different possible paths and follow a family through those different possible futures and i'm really really excited about that project <laughs> That sounds, yeah, that, that last one sounds like something that I would definitely be interested in. Um, yeah. I think we are still um, waiting for any questions to come into the chat, but I guess I'll ask you um, one last one more, and it's a bit of an open-ended one, and it's a bit, yeah, a bit of a cop-out question, I have to say. Um, but my main point is, what still gives you hope to keep mm. going? Mm. Well, so... Um... My young friend uh, Greta says um, the crucial thing is to take action. Uh, and when we take action, then hope springs up everywhere. So that's one way I'd like to sort of reframe that. People often ask me this question, what gives you hope? Uh, and I sort of turn it around and say, if we do stuff, then we start to get more hopeful. If we do stuff, especially if it works, like what we did in Extinction Rebellion in April 2019, really worked, made a difference to a national conversation. Uh, that gave a lot of people hope. The fact that we did that and it made that difference and it gave a lot of us uh, a lot of hope. So that would be the first part of my answer. Um, what I would add to that is that some of the stuff that gives me hope is the stuff that's in the book. So um, it gives me hope that there are quite a lot of people now feeling uh, climate anxious. Now that can sound like a strange thing to say, right? Uh, you know, isn't it? Isn't it sort of sad that they're feeling anxious? Well, of course, it's it's sad, um, but it's also good because it means that they're waking up to the reality of the situation. 
And it means they're moving into a kind of space where they may be willing to undertake some of this action that we need in order to generate hope. So it gives me hope that quite a lot of people now are feeling climate anxious. And it gives me hope that some of that anxiety is already translating uh, into, into action. And that's just a kind of an example, right? There's a whole load of things like that that, uh, that, that give me hope. So to, I suppose the way I would summarize it is by saying that what gives me hope is people doing stuff and people moving into a position where they're willing to do stuff, serious stuff, stuff that could, if you sum it all up all over the place, be enough. That's what this moderate flank idea is, is about. Loads and loads of people, far more than before, coming together to do what is uh, what is necessary. Um, so yeah, um, I think that um, some of the process is gonna be difficult, um, but uh, I think that the, uh, uh, the outcome um, could be very good. Um, it could it could be exactly what we need. Thank you. Um, we have now got some questions from the chat. Um, Noor, I know you put one in and I don't know if you're um, willing to come on and say it. If not, I can just read it. I think you might have disappeared. I know you're there. Um, Noor, if you want to say a question and unmute yourself, it's completely up to you. Just put a message in the chat. If not, I'm happy to read it out on your behalf. Because Noor was also um, part of our UKSSN book review group. Mm. Um, she, I think she did the first, very first chapter. But yeah, <laughs> the house is quite noisy. There you go, that's absolutely fine. Um, so um, she's written, in your book, you spoke about health being the one thing we might never be able to compromise on in chapter one. Yeah, chapter one, got it right. Um, health is often described by climate communicators as a really good topic as it applies across most partisan divides. Would you say health is a good thing to bring up in relation to cli the climate crisis or not? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. It's a complex um, uh, question. It's a complex topic. Um, you know, I think uh, on balance, my answer is uh, yes, it is. Uh, and let we can talk about mental health and physical health, right? So we've already been talking quite a bit about mental health, and we'll come back to that in a minute, maybe in response to Oscar's question, which I think is a really important one. But if we talk about physical health for a minute, um, one way into this uh, is understanding that um, our physical health is in some cases already being affected by the climate uh, situation. Uh, so what would be an example of that? Well, just think about the way that some people struggle a little bit in the intense heat this summer, for example. So we had a, a you know, a climate insane kind of heat wave, first ever 40 degrees temperature is in the UK this summer. Most of us coped with that perfectly well. We just um, you know, put on a fan or and didn't do too much exercise or stayed somewhere cool or stuff like that. But for some people with pre-existing health conditions or older people, it was very challenging. And there was um, tragically and predictably a spike in, um, in deaths during that uh, period. I'm not sure what the final figures were, but uh, I looked at it at one point and it looked like probably an extra two or 3,000 people died um, because of that uh, heat wave. Now, um, that kind of thing is going to carry on. So what's the point? The point is that climate um, breakdown is a, um, a physical ill health multiplier, as well as a mental ill health multiplier, although, you know, it's complicated. It's not really mental ill health, right? It's, it's like I said, it's actually healthy to be, uh, to be anxious, to feel some grief, etc. We'll come back to that point. So, when we get clear about that, and especially given that human beings are, are so concerned, and especially these days, and perhaps especially in a country like the UK with a National Health Service, the, our health is, is such a kind of um, focus of our concerns, and reasonably so. When people get clear about that, you know, they'll become clearer that the climate issue, people sometimes say it's an environmental issue. Um, but that's kind of misleading. It makes it sound as though it's sort of out there and it's sort of nothing to do with us in a certain way. It's actually a kind of everything issue. And it's certainly a health issue for the kind of reason I just started to uh, describe. And when people start to become clear about that, and I think people are gradually becoming clearer about it, it will become easier to do about it. 
do something about it, right? Because, um, as I say, loads of people are concerned about health as a, as an issue, as a political issue, etc. And when as people realise more and more, oh, so if we don't sort the climate issue over the next generation or two, we're going to have ramifying, worsening health effects. Well, I think that's quite a kind of significant uh, wake up. It's certainly something that policymakers are increasingly uh, aware of. So I would say my answer is, is yes, um, that there is a really important and growing health aspect to the climate question. And it's one that uh, we need to uh, address and get clear on. And it can help us to address the causes of the of climate breakdown. It can help us to get on side people who might think, well, I'm not really that bothered about climate or the environment. I'm not that kind of person. Are you bothered about health? Well, then you're bothered about climate. Yeah, I think that that last point is something I know people don't see the link between a lot of things to do with the climate if you've maybe not looked into it at all, but so much is intertwined in this issue. So and I'll just read out Oscars because I know you mentioned it. So we'll go we'll go yeah. to that one next. Um, does anxiety actually drive people to take action? There's a bit more, but I just um and he reckons that sometimes anxiety is often a counterproductive measure. And it seems to me that most people who take action are excited by opportunities, at least as much as they are scared for, by possibilities. So of course you're right, Oscar, that uh that hope, um, excitement, opportunities are all important. But there is lots of evidence that anxiety drives action um as well and fear. Um there's a, a famous um, BBC series by Adam Curtis um, some years ago called The Power of Nightmares, uh, which um, sets this out in detail, how um, bad scenarios as well as good scenarios are motivating. But look, I do take the concern behind your question, and I take the concern behind your question to be this. If all we do is create anxiety, is that going to be productive of action? And I think the answer to that question is no. Uh, we need to have a context in which that anxiety is meaningful. It needs to be able to be processed. So you need to be able to talk about it typically with someone, uh, maybe in a, in a psychotherapeutic or counseling context, maybe just with your friends, maybe with your parents. You know, there's all sorts of ways you can do this, maybe in a classroom. Um, it needs to be able to be processed. There needs to be some kind of um, off-ramp from it, or if you put it another way, an on-ramp into action. I mean, one of the most powerful antidotes, if you will, to uh, anxiety or, or to be a bit more precise to getting stuck in anxiety uh, is to be able to do something meaningful to tackle the causes of it. So if you get engaged in climate action, if you get engaged in doing something along with other people, it's very, very well proven that that can help sort out your, your mood and your condition. So anxiety alone is bad, but anxiety in the right context, anxiety in the context of mutual support, anxiety in the context of there being ways that one is invited to take action, Anxiety is something which is meaningful within the context of this of this human broader context in which we find ourselves. That's when it can be good and useful. Brilliant. Thank you, Oscar. I hope that answered your question. It was a it was a brilliant question. Um, I'm just going to hand back over to Mary again to ask um, one last question. Uh, thank you, Ashley. I believe we had a, a question from Meryl. Meryl, did you want to ask your question or shall I ask it for you? I'm going to leap in there. Is she still here? Yes, no, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Now. There we go. Right. I'm looking at state. Oops, there. I've even lost myself. Look at me. I'm right state. Ah, my, <laughs> computer's, my computer's going really slow for some reason. Right. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Right. I'm here. Um, hello, Rupert. And Hi. Else. I look a state because I've just um, been running around on um, doing stuff. So I saw you talk a couple of years ago in Newcastle and it was I, I, my teenage daughter was with me and it was really impactful um presentation yep. and uh with you're talking through the different scenarios and the one yes. that really stuck in my mind was this idea of having a few thousand breeding pairs of humans in the arctic and that was it that was just before the pandemic and then we had lockdown and things have changed things have changed considerably there has been 
there is, even though COP's not been great, um, you know, the, yes, we might have lost some damage fund. Yes, they're going to listen to pupil, uh, student voice more, young people's voices. But, you know, has your idea about what, what's going to happen in the future, predicting that future is really difficult. So what do you, what do you think now? Are okay, so let me clarify a little bit. I think what you're remembering is not exactly something that I said, let alone something I predicted. What you're remembering is something that I quoted. Quoted, okay, so sorry. This is, a, this is a, an idea of James Lovelock's, uh, the, the, the famous uh, climate scientist, inventor of the, the Gaia concept, who died uh, recently at the age of 102. Um, and this is Lovelock's prediction. This is what he thinks is going to happen. Um, now, uh, if I remember rightly, at the time, what I probably said is, um, I think it's conceivable that that could happen. Uh, I don't think it's at all likely. It's okay. conceivable if sort of everything goes wrong. Um, uh, uh, what I think is much more likely um, is that uh, we will endure some kind of partial collapses or collapses of uh, some society or societies, uh, and out of the ashes we'll build something uh, better. Um, what I think is possible, although not particularly likely, is that we'll manage to transform things in such a way that we don't have to endure those kinds of uh, uh, collapses. Um, so my view is not as pessimistic uh, as Lovelock's. The really important point here, and this is what I tried to evoke in my little film, Out of the Ashes, um, and, and in a lot of my work, actually, um, is that it's kind of up to us, that we have some real agency uh, and power uh, here uh, if we act uh, together. Um, that the future is not set in stone, that anyone who tells you the future is definitely going to be really good and anyone who tells you the future is definitely going to be really bad, they, they don't know what they're talking about. You, anyone who says that, you should distrust them. Um, we don't know what the future will be like. We've got certain parameters. Um, there are certain kind of scenarios that are possible and other scenarios that are um, virtually impossible or completely impossible. And we could have a long discussion about what exactly those are. And I try to talk about some of those in my work. But the really key point is there is still a great deal of uh, room for manoeuvre. Um, I'm less hopeful about the, the COP process than by the sounds of it you are. I think that COP26 was, was pretty disastrous. I think COP27 was even worse. Uh, yes, we had the Loss and Damage Fund, but they've also made decisions which mean that there will be more loss and damage. Exactly. Right? So it's incredibly, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly ironic. You know, there's going to be more loss and damage. And here's a fund that will help you cover uh, some of it. Um, so I think the situation that we're in internationally is pretty terrible. But um, we, we've seen in the last few years how it's possible for there to be um, deeply unexpected um, social movements such as Extinction Rebellion and the school climate strikes. And now I'm trying to co-create a new one, the moderate flank movement. We've seen in the last few years how completely unexpected events can be transformative of our world and of our politics. I'm thinking of the COVID pandemic and, and now the Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, um, there is much that hasn't been really attempted yet. And there is a huge amount of more waking up to do. As a lot more people wake up in the next uh, few years, um, we don't know just how much possible social transformation there may be. Um, I think that uh, that that um, the scenario Lovelock paints, as I say, is incredibly unlikely. Um, uh, I think that things could go really well. I'm not sure that's particularly likely too, but we can aim for that and we should aim for that. And we should also aim at the same time to try actively to prevent the worst outcomes. Yeah, and, that, and education is part of that, which is why we're all here. Education is, is totally a uh, part of that. And also the power that young people have um, as potential um, activists and activators and the power that young people have um, as, um, as people who, um, older people should be holding in the light and thinking of and caring about really intensely is really important. You know, I thought the 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 slogan that the my, that the school strike, climate strikers used to use, which I found the most powerful, um, is save our world, where they were calling on us kind of older people um, to do something for them. Um, and uh, I think that's another power that young people have to be a kind of voice for the for the future and a voice that says in a very clear and probably emotionally laden way 
that there is um, a, a huge and vital task here for us all to step up to. But in the first instance, those who need to step up to it are parents, adults, teachers, uh, etc. Because we have more of the conventional forms of power than young people have. Thank you. Thank you. Right, and I have, I, I do, I resonate quite a lot with that because I have, as a young person, I think that is what we're all trying to do is get people to listen to us as much as, as much as we can. And I know I am waiting for the day where I have, I mean, I am, I've just turned 18. And the first thing I did was register to vote. Very excited about all that sort of stuff. Get, getting that power is, is something that I am very interested in. Um, and we just have one last quick question yep. um, from our primary network, um, which is, for very young children, can you recommend any good resources that nourish their eco spirit whilst protecting the little ones from climate anxiety or feeling like they have a disproportionate amount of responsibility? Yeah, well, now um, I'm pretty good at answering questions and I hope you think I've done a good job in the last 45 minutes, but I'm going to struggle with this one a bit because uh, I uh, I'm not expert in uh, in very young children. The only thing that's really coming to mind for me, and maybe there's other people on the call who can do better than this, is that uh, some of the Dr. Zeus uh, stories are very much in the ballpark. Uh, the Lorax is a famous one. Uh, um, the Grinch that sold Christmas is also uh, relevant. Um, so I would recommend uh, Dr. Zeus, but that's about the best that I can do. I don't know if anyone else here can do uh, can add anything uh, even better. That is that is absolutely fine. It means okay. we've, we've we've ended the questions bang on time. So that short response is has, has, okay. Uh, good, good. <laughs> saves us all a bit. Phew. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Jess has asked for suggestions in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to quickly pass over to Mary for her sort of final thoughts. Oh, final thought. Too many, too many to mention. Um, I, I love the fact that you're getting into eco spirituality. I'll be really interested in that. It's something that as a teacher, I've long been interested in the fact that this is a mental health problem, that if I can teach students to be resilient about the anxiety you have to feel, then they can move through that into hope. Um, and I see it as a, an addiction issue. Um, it's very, very similar to if, if, if you I, I had to give up cigarettes shamefully. Um, about 20 years ago before I got pregnant um, and to give up cigarettes you have to face the fact that the cigarettes could well kill you that they will damage your children that they will damage your loved ones around you and that has to become a very real and intimidating and terrifying part of your life before you can give it up but you have to move forward in the hope that if you give it up it, your life will be better and that's the transformation you then make so yeah you have to manage that anxiety um, and I think so I work a lot on my students' mental health, but I think mm. that, yeah, that there needs to be more done on that as a spiritual aspect as well. I really like that. Yeah, well, I, uh, naturally, I, I agree. And just but just on the purely mental health aspect, I would say that I guess part of what I'm trying to say here this evening is the situation is is bad. And that's what my book is about. Uh, and I think we shouldn't overly protect children from that. They deserve to know the truth, just like anybody else uh, does. And one part of how the situation can be made less bad, as we've said, is by talking about it. And one of the things that that really helps people, I think, including young people, uh, one of the ways that really helps people is people realize, well, at least we can talk about it. At least it's not so bad that we have to uh, shove it into an attic. You know, if something is being sort of deliberately kind of suppressed and not talk about, not talked about, then people, and this definitely includes children, are afraid, God, it must be really, really, it must be unimaginably terrible if we if we have to pussyfoot around it. And just the act of being able to break the taboo and kind of come into the open on these questions is itself, I think, it's a huge kind of sigh of relief. It's like, oh, it's okay to feel a bit anxious. Oh, it's okay to feel a bit uh, down. Oh, it's okay to want to talk about these things. We can talk about them. And then we get into a space where we can start to make progress, I think. It's really nice as a teacher to be given that permission to um, open, up that, open up that dialogue with children because a lot of the time you get kind of, oh, you shouldn't make the children feel anxious about it. Because mm. it, it, it's not really about making them feel anxious, is it really? It's, you know, a lot of children are already there. They're already yeah. feeling that anxiety. Some of them have been growing up with it. You know, like I'm very struck, for example, by the fact that my students, 
my first year students at university now, they are younger than Greta Thunberg. You know, for, for, her, for them, that she's sort of an older person, right? They've been growing up with, with this. So, you know, I think, I think that's a really crucial point. It's about giving a little bit of permission if you're feeling some uh, anxiety in response, you know, rational response to this situation, that's okay. Brilliant. Um, Rupert, I would just like to kind of end with, a, I guess, a big thank you. I mean, I did, I read your whole book through the summer and it was transformative. I was, I did believe I was a pretty, pretty um, sort of hard climate advocate. And I guess that kind of drew me into really thinking about the harder stuff that we're going to have to face. Like I said, as a, I, yeah. I'm in, I'm just turned 18. So I've been, I have, like you said, have grown up with this now. And I think sort of spaces like this where we can talk about um, how we feel about it and stuff like that. It's just a big shout out to the UK stand as well, a little bit. Um, so yeah, just um, final final thank yous. And I think everyone here has found um, this talk very interesting. Um, and just for everyone to know, is that where can people buy your book? Oh, um, well, uh, at all good bookshops, as the classic <laughs> answer goes, um, you can get it direct from Bloomsbury Press um, if you want. Um, you can get it from, from their website. Or I would say, you know, try and get it from an ethical bookshop or your local bookseller uh, rather than using Amazon. That would be my plug. Don't use Amazon wherever possible. And am I am I right in thinking you've got another one coming out quite soon? When is it now? Well, time? it's actually out. <laughs> my new book, Do You Want to Know the Truth, is uh, is out. Um, and something that's good about this uh, for any of you out there who are um, not very flush is that you can actually download this one for, for free if you want to. Uh, if you if you Google, do you want to know the truth, Rupert Reed, um, you should pretty quickly get to a way you can download the ebook for, for free. I decided to make this one available for free 